This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 116. Coming up on Space Time. Lunar water, more abundant than previously thought. The Milky Way's clumpy galactic halo. And the Expedition 63 crew returns safely to Earth. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have discovered that water may be far more abundant on the Moon than previously thought. Water ice has already been detected on the permanently shadowed floors of craters near the lunar poles, where sunlight never reaches. And signatures for hydroxyls, that is molecules made up of one hydrogen and one oxygen atom, have been detected on the lunar surface. Now, a new study reported in the journal Nature Astronomy has confirmed that water molecules comprising one oxygen and two hydrogen atoms, good old H2O, has been found in lunar regolith, even in sunlit areas of the Moon. The observations were made by SOFIA, the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy, a converted Boeing 747SP airliner fitted with a 2.7-metre infrared reflector telescope. The Airborne Observatory, which is operated by NASA and the German Aerospace Center DLR, was able to detect the molecules in the Moon's southern hemisphere. SOFIA project scientist Alessandra Roy from DLR says scientists have been looking for water on the Moon ever since the first lunar rocks were brought back to Earth in the 1960s. However, evidence has been hard to come by. The first confirmation of lunar water came in 2008 from NASA's Moon Meteorology Mapper aboard the Indian Chandrayaan-1 spacecraft, which detected it frozen on the shaded floors of dark polar craters. SOFIA was able to identify the unmistakable fingerprint of water molecules in the mid-infrared range at a wavelength of 6 micrometers in the vicinity of the Clavius crater in the Moon's southern hemisphere. And that raises some interesting questions. Where did the water in these non-polar regions come from? And how come it can persist in these areas where, without an atmosphere, surface temperatures can reach something like 230 degrees Celsius, hot enough to cause water to evaporate under the heat of the light of the sun? Now, it's possible that micrometeorites, which are constantly falling onto the lunar surface, are carrying small quantities of water, which are then deposited into the lunar rocks during collisions. In the process, the water becomes enclosed in tiny glass bead-like structures in the ground. Another idea involves a two-stage process in which hydrogen from the solar wind reaches the lunar surface and combines with hydroxyl molecules on the ground to form water molecules. The data acquired by SOFIA indicates that most of this water being detected so far lies within a substrate covering the lunar surface. Now, we're not talking about much. Roy estimates it's about the equivalent of a 300 milliliter can of drink spread over a surface area the size of a football pitch. In reality, it means the moon's still drier than the deserts of Earth. But the quantity of water that's been discovered could still prove important for future missions to the moon. Sophia will now observe the moon's sunlit surface during different lunar phases to investigate this water phenomenon in greater detail. Scientists hope that this will open up a new insight into where the water on the moon comes from, how it's stored, and how it's distributed across the surface. Meanwhile, a second study, also reported in the journal Nature Astronomy, modelled areas of the lunar surface cast in permanent shadow, finding that these so-called cold traps contain at least 20% of all the water ice on the Moon. It seems small scattered cold traps are scattered across the lunar polar regions and could provide accessible water resources, which could be used for drinking, for making oxygen for breathing, and making oxygen and hydrogen for rocket fuel. One of the study's authors, Norbert Schrogoffer from the Planetary Science Institute, says future lunar rovers may have a hard time driving into deep, dark craters with extremely low temperatures, but smaller cold traps would be far more accessible. He says approximately 10-20% to 20% of the permanent cold trap area for water is found to be contained within micro-cold traps, most of which are less than a metre across. The discovery changes science's perspective of water on the Moon, which until now is focused on the largest water reservoirs situated within the broadest and deepest craters at high latitudes. Astronomer Jonty Horner from the University of Southern Queensland says these latest discoveries of water on the Moon will play a major role in the Artemis missions, returning humans to the lunar surface in 2024. 
a few ways you can look at it. One of them that is much more general, and I don't think people touch on that much, is that we're really shattering this myth that water is scarce in the universe, which is something that's been a bit of a bugbear of mine for a couple of decades, really, since I started my career. Water is everywhere. It's just it's water ice rather than liquid water. And what we found over the last decade or so is that the more places that we look, the more we're finding water in places that you've never even imagined. You know, there were announcements of water ice on Mercury at one point, and that's the last place you'd think to look. What we're finding here is that the suspicions we've had for a long time that there is water at the poles of the moon have been kind of confirmed and more than confirmed. There's more water there than people imagined. There are more locations where you'll be able to access that water potentially from a technology point of view down the line. And that has real exciting implications for the future of kind of human space exploration, particularly from the point of view of going places and then creating your own fuel there to go on from there, which if you can do that, it saves a huge amount of cost because if you only can produce fuel on Earth, You've got to launch that fuel into space to take with you for whatever future endeavors you want to undertake. And the problem is that launching from Earth is hard because the Earth has such a strong gravitational pull. You've got the atmosphere as well. So every time you add more fuel, you've then got to use more fuel to launch the fuel. So you have this kind of runaway growth in weight. If you can be confident that where you're going, you can replenish your supply of fuel, essentially. You can launch much more cost effectively from the Earth because you know you can then refuel en route. So that's going to be really useful in decades to come, not in the years to come, but in the decades to come, as we look to kind of further our expansion as a species into the solar system. So once again, we're looking at using the moon as the jumping off point for places like Mars and beyond. I think so, or one of them. That might be slightly better way of hedging our bets for the future, because obviously as a scientist, we never said definitely this, definitely that. But I think what this does is it strengthens the case for the moon to be a big part of that picture. With the Artemis mission that NASA are putting together, we've got this idea of sending people back to the moon. But further down the line, the part of the Artemis project that people don't talk about as much is that a couple of years after that first trip back to the moon, they're really keen to build a permanent base on the moon. I guess in much the same way as the International Space Station has been a permanent outpost in space for humanity. The idea is to build a base, Artemis base, at the south pole of the moon and to make use of resources obtained locally, it's called in-situ resource utilization, to make that base viable. And that would then be a first step to using that as a bridging point to go further into the solar system. There's then discussion further down the line of building something called Gateway in orbit around the moon. I think Gateway is actually a a critical part of the project of getting to the moon in the first place. Uh, The European Space Agency have just signed an agreement with NASA. They're supplying some of the modules for it. Those modules have to be ready within the next four years. The idea is that Gateway will be the staging post for missions down to the lunar surface. The Artemis 3 mission, which is going to be taking the first humans back to the lunar surface, it's only going as far as Gateway. There'll then be a lunar transfer vehicle, which will actually take two of the crew members down to the lunar surface and back again. Yeah, and I think what this reflects on the, the number of changes we're seeing in this, because I think it's only a couple of months ago that I was reading a report saying Gateway had been shelved as too hard and now they've gone back to it. They've got such aggressive timelines in place here, and that's why we laugh a little bit, because it sounds mind-blowingly fast compared to the way that science normally proceeds. Because we've got such aggressive timelines, it makes it a much more malleable picture. They've got all these different pieces of the puzzle that they're trying to put together, and they have to have contingencies for, well, what if Gateway isn't ready in time? How do we proceed and see how things go? So I think that's why we're seeing so much fluidity in the plan seeming to shift. And I'm not saying for one minute that it can't be achieved on the timelines that they've got. It's just very aggressive and very optimistic, which means you need a lot of money and a lot of will behind it to make that actually happen. Of course, it's been done before. The 1960s with the race to get the first people on the moon is a shining example of what can happen when there's a really strong will and lots of money being thrown at a problem. And I suspect in 1963, nobody would have imagined that the end of the decade was feasible. It just sounded like a political talking point, but they made it happen. And so this could happen. And the water that they found there, coming back to this story, is going to be an integral part of that. And these new discoveries, I think, strengthen the argument, strengthen the case for the South Pole being the right place to go, for building a permanent place there, and also for the use of the South Pole and Gateway as a stepping stone to the rest of the solar system. What makes this discovery interesting is that we're not just talking about hydroxyls. I mean, I think Cassini first detected hydroxyls on the lunar surface. We're actually talking about (laughs) molecules of water. Yeah, I think there's two things in this that I'm really excited about. 
Firstly, it's the confirmation that it really is water rather than other molecules involving oxygen and hydrogen that are probably water, but we can't be sure. Mm. So it's an incremental step along the line, which is the way that science works. And we always kind of sometimes see in reporting these great steps that are envisioned in terms of massive scientific revolutions. But in reality, this is part of an ongoing incremental process. Really like that, but I find the other paper actually even more exciting, the cold traps, the idea that the water is more widespread because the conditions you need for it to accumulate are more easily reached in these little cold traps, which means that you don't necessarily have to go to the bottom of the deepest craters at the South Pole. It may be easier to get water more widely and extract it more easily. Now, that's a question for the people who are looking at resource extraction to answer, but it must make their life easier looking forward to think of a wider scope of environments and a wider scope of conditions that they can play with. I guess the only thing that worries me about the cold traps is that most of them are only about a metre or so across, so there wouldn't be a lot of water there. Absolutely, and I mean, all of these things are talking about water on the moon at a level that it is much drier than the Sahara Desert. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't imagine that the moon is an incredibly damp and soggy place, at least on the surface. But when you've got that kind of stuff there, it means that people can look at developing technology to extract it. And, you know, we do that kind of thing on Earth. I would hate to think of people strip mining the lunar south pole. That's but probably one of the easiest ways you can imagine it is having something that just crawled across. Yeah. Well, I wonder whether, especially given the growing efforts people have to recognize the cultural importance of the moon and to try and balance off the preservation of the moon that we've seen for generations, for future generations, with our need and our urge to expand and to commercialize things. I wonder whether people will look for more either non-invasive, non-destructive type methods or for things that operate out of sight, you know, so tunneling rather than being on the surface, or whether it's possible to build something that drives over the top and vaporizes the water and collects it almost like, I guess, distilling alcohol. You know, you boil it off collect it, funnel it into a thing. Now, I know people are putting a huge amount of effort and research into different ways that you can extract resources off Earth. And I mean, I'm involved with a company here in Southeast Queensland that is working with Data61 from CSIRO, looking at all these kind of problems and how you pick the right areas to go to, to extract resources. So it's a very, very real project, a very real concern going forward. And I'm going to be really fascinated to see whether we manage to balance the cultural sensitivity, the need to have the moon look how it always has done, the need to protect something for future generations, with the commercial and probably fairly rapacious need to make the most money with the minimum investment. How that gets balanced off is going to be really fascinating to see, and I think it's going to be an interesting few decades to see how society and globally we handle this. That's Professor Jonty Horner from the University of Southern Queensland. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Still to come, the Milky Way's clumpy galactic halo and the Expedition 63 crew return safely to Earth. All that and much more still to come on Space Time. A new study has concluded that our Milky Way galaxy is surrounded by a lumpy halo of hot gases continuously being fed by material ejected by the birth and death of stars from within our galaxy. A report in the journal Nature Astronomy claims this heated halo, known as the circumgalactic medium, was the incubator for the Milky Way's formation some 10 billion years ago and could be where basic baryonic matter, unaccounted for since the birth of the universe, currently resides. One of the study's authors, Philip Corrette from the University of Iowa, says the observations suggest that there's more X-ray emissions being generated in the area of the circumgalactic medium close to where the galaxy's forming stars more vigorously. And that suggests that the circumgalactic medium is related to star formation. Corrette says it could mean that gas which previously fell into the Milky Way helped make stars and is now being blasted back into the circumgalactic medium by these stars. The new findings are based on observations made by a spacecraft called HaloSat, a mini-satellite designed to look for X-rays emitted by the circumgalactic medium. HaloSat was launched from the International Space Station in May 2018. Its readings indicate that the circumgalactic medium has a disk-like geometry. Each galaxy is surrounded by its own circumgalactic medium. 
And these regions are crucial for understanding not only how galaxies formed and evolved, but also how the universe progressed from an initial blast of hydrogen and helium to become the cosmological expanse teeming with stars, planets and other celestial constituents which we see around us today. HaloSat's primary mission was searching for atomic remnants known as baryonic matter, believed to be missing since the universe's birth some 14 billion years ago. The satellite's been observing the Milky Way's circumgalactic medium, looking for evidence of leftover baryonic matter which may reside there. To do that, Coret and colleagues wanted to get a better handle on the circumgalactic medium's configuration. The authors wanted to find out if the circumgalactic medium is a huge extended halo, many times the size of the Milky Way galaxy itself. If so, then it could house the total number of atoms required to resolve the missing baryon question. However, if the circumgalactic medium is composed mostly of recycled material, it would be a relatively thin puffy layer of gas and unlikely to host the missing baryonic matter. Caret and colleagues found a high-density part of the circumgalactic medium that's bright in X-ray emissions. But there could still be a really big extended halo that goes beyond that but which is dim in X-rays, making it much harder to see because of all the glare generated by the bright emission disk. Caret says he was surprised by the circumgalactic medium's clumpiness, expecting its geometry to be far more uniform. The denser areas are regions where stars are forming and where material is being traded between the Milky Way and its circumgalactic medium. Importantly, these findings mean the Milky Way and other galaxies aren't closed systems, but instead are interacting with their circumgalactic mediums, both sending material out and drawing it in as well. The next step will be to combine the halo sat data with data from other X-ray observatories to determine whether there's an extended halo surrounding the Milky Way, and if there is, to calculate its size. And that, in turn, could ultimately solve the missing baryon puzzle. This is Space Time. Still to come, the Expedition 63 crew returns safely to Earth, and later in the science report... A new study confirms that koala populations on the New South Wales north coast have been in steady decline for decades. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. You may be wondering why you need a virtual private network. Well, it's in the name. It's all about privacy. Do you really want big brother tech companies, hackers, governments, and who knows who else snooping in on your online activities? Now, you might not have anything to hide, but it's still really creepy, and it could be dangerous for you and those you care about. Also, how often do you run across a website and you want to get information from it, but you find out that they're geo-blocked? It's all very frustrating, and it's becoming an increasing problem. And that's where ExpressVPN can help you. ExpressVPN's a simple and efficient way to protect your online privacy. It's internet without borders from the world's leading VPN provider. So, protect your online privacy today. And find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. And of course, you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. After 196 days aboard the International Space Station, the Expedition 63 crew have returned safely to Earth aboard their Soyuz MS-16 capsule. The spacecraft touched down on the cold Kazakhstan steppes three hours and 22 minutes after undocking from the orbiting outpost. We're now less than 15 minutes away from the Soyuz MS-16's deorbit burn. That's scheduled for 9 p.m. Central Time when the Soyuz will be about 20 miles away from the space station. That burn is going to last five minutes and 20 seconds, during which the thrusters firing will act as a break on the Soyuz vehicle while it's still 260 miles above the Earth, slowing it down by 128 meters per second or 268 miles per hour and dropping it out of orbit. 
basically flips around, turns, uh, and fires its thrusters into the direction that it was traveling to slow it down and drop it out of orbit. About 23 minutes later, at 9.28 p.m., that's when the Soyuz is at an altitude of 87 miles above the Earth. The vehicle's computer will command the descent module of the Soyuz to separate from the rest of the spacecraft just above the first traces of the Earth's atmosphere. The orbital module on top, which is where the crew has a small amount of room to move around during its flight to the space station after launch, and the instrumentation and propulsion module on the bottom, which house the oxygen storage tanks, attitude control thrusters, avionics, and communications and control equipment. Those will all separate from the descent module in the middle where the crew is seated. The descent module contains personally contoured seats for the crew members used during launch, entry, and landing, as well as all the controls and displays needed for critical flight activities. It also has life support provisions, batteries for re-entry and landing, and parachutes and soft landing rocket engines to slow the vehicle just before touchdown. The orbital module and the instrumentation and propulsion module will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, while the descent module continues on with Cassidy, Evanition, and Wagner inside. Then three minutes later, at 9.31 p.m., 60 miles or 316,000 feet above the Earth, the Soyuz will begin atmospheric reentry. At that point, the descent module's computers will orient the capsule with its ablative heat shield pointing forward to protect it from the heat as it begins to fly through the Earth's atmosphere. And the crew will begin to feel the first effects of gravity again at that point. That's going to build through about 9.38 p.m. when they'll experience a maximum pressure or G-load for the descent. That will probably briefly cause them to feel four to five times the force of gravity. Just two minutes later, 15 minutes before touchdown, when the Soyuz is 35,105 feet above the Earth and traveling at a speed of about 514 miles per hour, the Soyuz computers will command the first of a series of parachutes to deploy. Two pilot parachutes will come first, one 6.7 square feet and one 48.4 square feet, and together they will drag out the drogue chute, a 258 square foot parachute that slows the Soyuz down to 178 miles per hour. Drogue chute also will create a gentle spin for the Soyuz as it uh, dangles underneath, which will help stabilize the capsule. Just before touchdown, that drogue chute will be jettisoned to make way for the deployment of the 3,281-foot main parachute. It continues slowing the capsule down to a speed of about 16 miles per hour. At first, the capsule hangs beneath it at a 30-degree angle to the horizon to help with aerodynamic stability, but after one of the two harnesses connecting the parachute to the capsule is severed, the Soyuz will ride itself so that it's in a vertical position through touchdown. When the capsule is just 16,000 feet or three miles from the Earth's surface, the vehicle's heat shield will be jettisoned and any residual propellant will dissipate. Without the heat shield, the Soyuz altimeter, an instrument that uh, measures altitude by bouncing signals to the ground and back to the Soyuz, will be exposed to the surface of the Earth and it will be used to provide the capsule's computers updated information on altitude and rate of descent. At that point, the vehicle's computers will also arm the module's seat shock absorbers. When the Soyuz reaches an altitude of about 39 feet, the cockpit displays will tell Anatoly Venetian, who's the Soyuz commander, to prepare for the firing of the soft landing en engines. Those are six solid propellant engines, and they actually will be fired just three feet above the ground and two seconds before touchdown, allowing the Soyuz to slow down to five feet per second, or about three and a half miles per hour, for a landing at 9.55 p.m. Central Time, or 8.55 a.m. Local Time in Kazakhstan. Ready, and SKD covers are open. Orbital maneuver engine covers are open. Crew reporting all systems are ready for the deorbit run to begin, and again, that's going to last five minutes and 20 seconds. We have a third burn has begun now. The parameters are nominal. The combined propulsion system, 045 delta V, 12.6 on the nozzles. The parameters are nominal. Copy. Two minutes into the burn now. As you're hearing, everything continuing to look good. Two minutes, 59 seconds. The parameters are nominal. 045 delta V. 0 0.46 for delta V. 4, 2, 1, 0. We are done with the burn. The burn is complete. And there you go. Complete deorbit burn now. That was about uh, 5 minutes and 20 seconds long, and that uh, was intended to drop the Soyuz, uh, slow it down and drop it back into the Earth's atmosphere so that it could begin its journey home to the steppe of Kazakhstan today. Crews now on their way for a 9.55 p.m. Central Time landing. 
with the orbit burn complete, the next uh, milestone that, we, that we'll be watching for is the separation of the Soyuz descent modules from the other parts of the spacecraft. Reports from the team who is gathering at the landing site that uh, everything is going well and, and normally they are also reporting that they have good communication back and forth with the crew despite the fact that we can't hear it at the moment. So we'll continue uh, giving you these updates as we get them. And reports are that everything is going nominally. A minute and a half left to go until touchdown. Diesel use under its parachute, making its way down for today's landing. That should be coming up very soon at this point. Just before landing, ammunition will get a notice from the computers to prepare to fire six solid propellant engines called the soft landing engines and slow the Soyuz down to five feet per second or about 3.5 miles per hour. Soyuz has now touched down in Kazakhstan, 9.54 p.m. Central Time. After after 83 million miles, Chris Cassidy, Anatoly Ivanishin, and Ivan Bogner are home. Crew now safely on the ground. That wraps up Chris Cassidy's third trip to space and his second long-duration mission. He spent 15 days in space during STS-127 in July of 2009 and another 166 days during Expedition 25 in 2013. In 196 days, he added on with this trip, Cassidy now has a cumulative, cumulative total of 378 days spent in space, earning him the fifth spot on the list of most time spent in space by an American. He also added four spacewalks to his previous six, and with a total of 10, is now tied for most spacewalks by a NASA astronaut and ninth for all astronauts. He has spent a total of 54 hours and 51 minutes spacewalking over the course of his three space flights. And Anatoly Venetian also had two previous days in space, and uh, they were both long duration missions, so he is coming home with a total of 476 days in space, enough to earn him the 25th place on the all time list of time spent in space. And this flight was a first for Ivan Bogner his first trip to space, so he has racked up a total of 196 days on this mission. During their 3,136 orbits on station, the Expedition 63 crew welcomed the SpaceX Demo 2 crew who flew up aboard their Crew Dragon 2 spacecraft, the first astronauts to launch to the space station on an American spacecraft from American soil since the retirement of the space shuttle fleet in 2011. They also undertook four spacewalks totaling 23 hours and 37 minutes to upgrade the station's external battery supply. While on station, they contributed to hundreds of experiments, including a study on the influence of gravity on electrolytic gas evolution, which looks at bubbles created using electrolysis. You see, gravity is a key factor for creating buoyancy for bubbles, so microgravity makes it possible to single out bubble growth and study its effect in processes. Using this method to better understand how bubbles grow could improve devices like medicine delivery using small bandage-like skin patches. The crew also worked with AstroBee, a cube-shaped free-flying robot that may one day assist astronauts on station with routine duties. And they conducted research for the Onco-Selectors experiment, which leverages microgravity to identify target cancer therapies. When the crew departed the orbiting outpost, the Expedition 64 crew, who had flown up days earlier aboard their Soyuz MS-17 capsule, officially took over Space Station Command. And later this month, the Expedition 64 crew will be joined by NASA's SpaceX Crew-1, the first long-duration mission to fly as part of NASA's commercial crew program, marking a return of American ability to regularly launch astronauts into space. For nearly 20 years now, the International Space Station has been continuously inhabited by humans, testing technologies, conducting research experiments, and developing the skills needed to explore further from the Earth, including a return to the Moon and ultimately Mars. In all, some 241 people from 19 countries, including Australia, have visited this unique microgravity laboratory, which has now hosted more than 3,000 scientific research experiments. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has confirmed that the combination of physical distancing measures can keep the COVID-19 coronavirus at bay. A report in the Lancet Medical Journal analysed data from 131 countries, including Australia and New Zealand, to determine the impact of physical distancing measures, such as work closures, caps on gatherings and public event bans, on the spread of COVID-19, finding the more the merrier. The study modelled the effect individual measures and four combinations of measures had on the virus's spread, 
Finding the most comprehensive package of restrictions led to the biggest reduction in the R number. Now, the R number, or reproduction number, is a key measure of virus transmission, whereby any number above 1 indicates an outbreak is growing, while a number below 1 indicates a shrinking outbreak. However, the authors warn that they can't account for all factors, including mask wearing, contact tracing, and those choosing not to comply with introduced measures. Nor does it take into account the deaths caused by the lockdown through suicides, deaths caused by the failure to undertake vital medical procedures due to the lockdowns, or the economic destruction and consequent ruining of lives resulting from the lockdowns. Over 45 million people have now been infected and more than 1.2 million killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first made its way into the community in Wuhan, China a year ago. Well, they're cute and cuddly and an icon of Australia, but a new study warns that koala populations on the New South Wales north coast have been in steady decline for decades now. The findings, reported in the journal PLOS One, looked at some 30 years of koala population data from Port Stephens, Port Macquarie and Lismore. The research by scientists from the University of Western Sydney found disease is the most common reason koalas have been admitted for veterinary care. The study identified both long-term trends and key stresses which have contributed to the decline of koalas, as well as looking at factors that could contribute to their successful rehabilitation. Scientists have developed a new super white paint which will reflect more heat back into space. A report in the journal Cell claims this new prototype super white paint so reflective that it can actually cool a surface temperature down to below the surrounding air temperature. The paint uses a natural heat shedding effect known as passive radiative cooling. It works by first absorbing and then emitting infrared radiation at wavelengths that reflect heat through the atmosphere and back into space. The test showed that the special paint cooled a sample to 10 degrees Celsius below ambient nighttime temperatures and some 1.7 degrees Celsius at high noon. Archaeologists have discovered a 2,100-year-old 34-metre-long image of a cat on the side of a hill on southern Peru's famous Nazca Plateau. The spectacular feline drawing adds to the spider, the hummingbird, the trident, the condor, the monkey and dozens of other geoglyphs located on the high desert Andean plain some 400 kilometres south of Lima. The designs were created by ancient people making depressions or shallow incisions on the desert floor, removing pebbles and leaving differently coloured dirt exposed. Mysteriously, many of the designs can only really be seen and appreciated from the air. Flat earthers getting lost trying to sell to the edge of the world. And a new study that claims 61% of Americans wouldn't buy a house if they thought it was haunted. They're just some of the myriad of silly stories Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics comes across every week. Yeah, there's always going to be some people who take their beliefs this far. These are two people in Italy as a middle-aged couple from Venice. They set out to prove their theory that the world is flat by sailing to an island called Lampedusa, which is between Sicily and North Africa, which makes it somewhere near Malta, I presume. And unfortunately, they didn't sail very well. I don't know how much sailing they've done in Venice, but... uh, There's a lot of water there, so... Yeah, there is, actually, but... They didn't go by gondola. They left Venice during the lockdown, and they went to a town on Sicily's north coast, and they sold their car, and they bought a boat, and they headed for Lampedusa, and they got completely wrong. They missed it entirely. actually ended up in an island off Sicily's north coast as opposed to its south coast. Why did they want Um, to go there? What was all that about? I don't want to prove that that was where the end of the world was. Oh, right. Um, so they wanted to prove- North Africa doesn't exist. Well, uh, <laughs> um, the, it, it could be the case, yes. I think for some reason they thought they could prove the Earth was flat. The trouble is it, it didn't work out for them. They certainly didn't end up where they wanted to be. And as someone pointed out, one, a, a doctor who helped the pair after they got lost, he said they were using a compass. And the thing is that a compass requires the Earth to be round for it to work. Unless the Earth's so, bar-shaped. Um, <laughs> it could be a bar- yes, or a horseshoe-shaped compass, maybe. Well, that would still be a <laughs> semi-round, wouldn't it? Yeah, because this was a lockdown, they were taken to quarantine. Then they um, escaped and returned to the sea. They were stopped again and taken back to quarantine. And a few days later, they tried to escape again but were unsuccessful. I'm not quite sure what the latest is on them at the moment, if they're still in quarantine or if they've been sent off somewhere else. This is some believers in crazy theories taken to extremes, really, and uh, they had to happen, and uh, it was fun for us, but it probably wasn't that much fun for them. But this happens a lot, where people come up with great conspiracy theories that they've counted for everything and in their minds, and then 
reality sinks in. You'd have to say this was pretty much proof that they sincerely held the beliefs. Right? Anyone who was having a joke about it or who was sort of in the more serious side creating fake conspiracies and fake theories is not going to go to this extent to actually prove it. They tend to do sort of uh, armchair research. And this couple, God bless them, uh, decided to actually put it into action. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out very well at all. They obviously weren't very well prepared to do it. They weren't very bright either, were they? Well, it's certainly not as far as navigating goes. <laughs> Home exorcists will help you sell your haunted house. If you've ever looked at real estate ads and real estate agents, they'll try a lot of things to actually um, encourage you to buy a house. Um, I've never seen a pool which is not described as sparkling. So every house has a sparkling pool. But apparently it turns out that about 61% of Americans in a survey said they would not buy a house if they thought it was haunted, which cut down your market quite a lot. So a particular organisation in Salt Lake City has set up a service where they will go and cleanse the house for you, and therefore it's available for purchase by people who are concerned about ghosts. The survey, which was done by an organisation called SoldMyHouse.com, which sounds like they're actually... S-O-U-L, sort of... is it sold? <laughs> no. It's definitely sold as in bought, but uh, obviously set up to try and sort of encourage some service by looking at a problem and then creating a service to solve the problem. A large number of people in America, even though it only surveyed about 5,000 people, but a large percentage say that they um, believe in ghosts or they have an experience with ghosts. Um, That's really the story, isn't it? The fact that, I mean, 5,000 is a decent-sized survey, and the fact that 61% believe in ghosts and and spirits and haunted houses is... Um... It, was actually, it, was interesting, it was interesting, the result, is that 55% said they believed in ghosts, but 61% would not buy a home if they thought it was haunted, which... How do you explain the added 11%? Therefore, a strange situation when you get more people say they wouldn't buy a home if they thought it was haunted, but a fair percentage of this, those don't believe in ghosts anyway, so the, you, you wonder about the survey. But anyway, 36% said they had a paranormal experience, 27% said they had a harmless experience with a ghost or spirit, 9% said they had paranormal experience was aggressive, uh, which is, you know, pains and noises and things broken. And 19% have talked with a psychic or priest about a supernatural event. The thing that they found out was that a home that's rumoured to be haunted will stay on the market for 133 days longer than the average home. And what makes a now, home did... haunted? Is it, the, is it the history of the house? There's been a murder there or has a red room? Or They tend to be old houses, but not necessarily. New houses can have ghosts, apparently. They obviously you know, have to look a bit spooky-ish, but not necessarily. Some of the houses that they say are haunted look pretty mundane. It's really sort of just reports of people saying they felt a presence or something like that, whether that's by paranormal investigators or just the general public having a haunted house down the road. Finding a particular reason for why a house could be haunted could cover a range of things. Someone once said, how do you know a house is haunted? It's not. <laughs> and so, but I mean, the fact that the house is going to stay on the market for another third of a year than an average home for sale would go for implies there's a lot of people out there who are either worried about a haunted house or because the house is rubbish. If the house is old and falling apart, it might be more inclined to have a ghost story associated with it. And at the same time, it might be less likely to be sold. But yeah, so here you have a, a real estate company that's offering a service, a home exorcism service to actually provide something for, for, for customers and perhaps you know, attract more customers to particular houses that aren't selling very well. That's t- Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. 
That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 